So tell us, Massimo, it's a big old uh, issue you're wrangling with here. Um, how, how can someone like Socrates teach us to be good? What's the, what's the central idea here? <laughs> Actually, he wasn't sure himself. Um, there, are, there are two pl places in the Platonic Dialogues where Socrates has different opinions about this. You know, in the, in the Meno, he seems to conclude that, no, you can't really teach virtue. And the reason he reaches that conclusion is because he looks around and he says, well, I don't see any teachers out there. You think that it's, if this were a normal thing to do, then you would be seeing plenty of people doing it. And I don't see anybody doing it. So now it can't be, it must, it must be that it's, it can't be done. But then, interestingly, in a platonic dialogue called the Protagoras, Socrates has this interesting interaction with one of the sophists, who are typically his arch enemies, right? Uh, and Protagoras convinces Socrates by the end of the dialogue that, yeah, it is possible to teach virtue. And that the way you do it is you imagine an analogy with another technique, another skill that people might want to learn. For instance, learning a musical instrument, right? Well, if you want to learn a musical instrument, there are three things you do, typically. You learn a little bit of the theory because it, it helps knowing notations and you know a little bit about uh, how the notes re relate to each other, that sort of stuff. You want a good teacher, if possible. You can do it on your own. It's not impossible to do it on your own, but it certainly helps if you have a teacher because it, the, the teacher will point out mistakes you're making. You're trying to correct the form, that sort of stuff, give you suggestions. But then most of it, most of the time, is spent just with yourself and your instrument going over scales and little tunes and stuff like that over and over and over and over. And so the idea, therefore, Protagoras says, and Socrates by the end agrees, that that's how you do it with virtue as well. Virtue means a particular way of looking at things and doing things especially. It's a, it's a character trait. So let's say, for instance, that you want to improve your generosity. You say, you know, being generous is a good thing, but I realize that I'm not as generous as I could be. Well, how do, how do you do it? There is a theoretical part, you know, why do you want to, what is generosity? What, why do you want to be more generous? Why is this an important thing? There is the bit about you might want to go to Socrates or to some modern, uh, you know, philosopher, practical philosopher, not not uh, not those people that are in the ivory tower thinking very abstruse thoughts, but you know, a practical philosopher. But mostly, what you do is you practice. Now, how would you practice something like generosity? Well, for instance, you could. It, the limit is really your imagination. But for instance, you could say things like do things like this, like well. Uh, let me get into the habit of when I leave the house, putting some change in my pockets, and then I'll give into the first homeless person that I meet. Right? Um, initially, this may be a counterintuitive, you know, a kind of awkward thing that, that you do. But then you, the more you do it, the more it becomes a habit. And then after a while, you don't even think about it. You just get before you leave the house, you pick up the change, and then you give it to somebody. It's like it really is like learning a musical instrument or going to the gym or, you know, anything that requires exercise. But here's the thing, I suppose. You have to want to be a generous person and fundamentally ungenerous people don't want to be generous, you, you might argue. Right. So in order to even go to the step of taking the change and put it in your pocket, you've already had to reach the first base in that set of thoughts. You had to say, I want to be a generous person. So you are kind of a generous person simply by wanting to be one, where well, you might have a stingy, grumpy, mean person who never even gets to that stage. And are they, yeah. are they unteachable? So you, are you only ever, can Socrates only ever preach to the converted? Well, yes and no. So that is one big reason. The one that you just pointed out is one big reason why in my book, I show that typically when uh, ancient philosophers try to teach virtue, to statesmen and politicians, they typically failed. Why? Because these were people who were already unreachable. They, they already were beyond, they were already, their, their character was already set. They were you know, adult individuals and uh, they were not inclined to uh, go the virtuous, on the virtuous path. The exceptions, the, the times where it does work, for instance, Marcus Aurelius or Julian the Apostate or something like that, those are because those people themselves, as you, were, as you just said, were kind of prone. They, they wanted to improve themselves. And at that point, they did find good teachers uh, that, that would help them. So that's broadly speaking true. Uh, once you become an adult, you know, let's say past your early to mid-20s, your character is pretty much set. 
you can improve a little bit. You can, you can, you know, uh, make things a little bit better, but fundamentally that's it, which again, it shouldn't be surprising. Think, think back to the analogy with learning a musical instrument. It's much easier to learn it when you're young than when you're an adult, right? Believe me, I tried. I tried to learn the, the saxophone as an adult. Yeah, I got a tune together. You know, you can recognize tunes, but yeah, I'm not going to play it at yeah. Carnegie Hall anytime soon. Or the same goes with, let's say, a language, yeah. right? It's much easier when you're young, and it's, it can be done, but it requires a lot of in, in, inner effort uh, to do it, and it doesn't come out as well. Which means that the second aspect to the question is, well, not only, of course, you want to you put it in terms of preaching to the converts, I would say help those that want to be helped, right? Uh, not only you want to do that, you also want to teach virtue, character, uh, good behavior to kids. I just saw a movie just yesterday, uh, a documentary called uh, Young Plato, which is uh, set in, uh, in Belfast and, and it, in an in a elementary school where the principal is trying to teach philosophy in stoicism mostly, but uh, also other aspects of practical philosophy to kids. And it's just fascinating because he's got the right idea. You don't preach to people who are already out of reach. You try to get the people whose character is still forming. But I guess the problem is that to, to get a good society, the people who are already out of reach are the ones you want to crack. The people in power are the ones you want to crack because they in turn have the most influence. And I wonder, can you make people good by appealing to their basic instincts? So do you say that actually it is, it is better for you to be good? So the net effect is goodness. And so we can experience it as goodness, but we might need to pull a lever or two where we appeal to someone's baser self-interest in order to achieve goodness. Is that, is that a doable proposition? I doubt it. And the reason I say that is because there's a chapter in the book where I go through the scientific evidence. This, this, you know, it's, it's nice to learn from the Greco-Romans, but we also want, you know, we live in the 21st century. There's a little bit of evidence from psychology and social science about what works and doesn't work in terms of improving character. And one of the things that doesn't work is to uh, trick people into doing things. You can, you can trick people into doing things. There, there is a large literature on nudging, for instance, of essentially manipulating uh, people's behaviors by uh, altering the incentives. Yeah, that does work in, in the short run. You actually do get the behavior, more or less, the behavior that you wanted, but you're not going to be able to change the person inside. You're not gonna, it's not a long-term effect. Um, I would suggest that the, the best thing that we can do in order to fix the situation immediately is to just get rid of the people that we have now in power. I mean, there is pretty good evidence that uh, you know, there's a study that came out a few years ago that shows that there are two professions that have a far larger percentage of sociopaths or, or people with sociopathic tendencies than average. And those two professions are politics and high finance, which probably doesn't surprise anybody <laughs> as, a, almost, as an empirical result. Almost the idea that if you want power, you, you, you almost disqualify yourself from, from having it. Exactly. But I do argue in the book that ultimately that's our own damn fault, because at least in democratic societies or more or less democratic societies, so, you know, in the United States, it's arguably a half in half of where I live. It's half away between a democracy and an, and an oligarchy. But anyway, in more or less democratic societies, ultimately, the buck does stop with us. I mean, the reason we have the leaders we have is because we put them there. Uh, there are lots of factors. There is, you know, obviously, especially there is a lot of money that goes into into politics, that sort of thing. But I think the approach would be would have to be two prone. One, the most important thing is the long term investment in the next generation. I mean, one of the astonishing things to me is when when I was looking at that documentary, you know, Young Plato that I just mentioned, is that why doesn't everybody do that? Why is this an exception um, as opposed to, you know, the normal way of doing things? So that, of course, he's not going to see that principle. He's not going to see results for, you know, 20 years. Well, ultimately, it's we don't. Gonna I, mean, be dead. I think the answer is probably we weirdly do not care about education in civilized societies. I mean, you do more in, in some than others, but in America, in the UK, for example, we probably regard education as a place where we put our kids so we can go to work. And we sort of hope they'll turn out well, <laughs> but we probably don't really value the people who do the teaching very much. We don't necessarily talk about the science of the best way of improving children. And so you end up with a, a sort of a mishmash of 
some people have good ideas, some people have bad ideas, but we ultimately just want someone to look after them between nine and four. Yeah, now I think that's there's quite a bit of truth in, into that. The interesting thing in, in the United States, at least, is that whenever there are elections coming up, especially national elections, uh, you know, pollsters ask people, so what, what are what kind of issues are at the forefront of your you know your your mind once now that the election is coming? And of course, typically the economy is number one, but certainly or every time within the first the top five people do list education but then they don't do anything about it and, and we don't pay you know if if that were true teachers would be paid like doctors absolutely and, uh, <laughs> and, and historically absolutely. They, don't, they never have been you know now people there are there are occasional experiments like the one of of the principal in in belfast that i mentioned even in the united states there are people who try to teach you know philosophy, critical thinking, uh, the basics of ethics at a pre-college level. And they typically run into a lot of resistance. And they run into, run into resistance, not from the kids. The kids usually enjoy it. Now, they have actually a good time doing it. But from two sources, politicians, local politicians especially, at a you know, state or local level, and parents, surprisingly. Now, I thought, like, wait a minute. What do these two categories of people have in common? politicians and parents well in the context of what we're talking about those are authority figures mm. and socrates would tell you that authority figures don't want people to think <laughs> you know we crit critically or to start saying all of a sudden you know what there is that this this really interesting scene you know it's kind of a stunning scene in the documentary uh where the principal says to the kids okay now i'm going to teach you how to question your parents it's like wait what yeah obviously the parents are not going to like that. No, but equally, I think people are also suspicious, maybe with some good reason, that notions of virtue and goodness aren't, they're, they're vague. They're not, they're not something we can point to like a musical instrument. We know what a musical instrument is. We can say, if you play the clarinet, we all know what the clarinet is. It's a very straightforward understanding. Maybe yeah. people are concerned that what is virtue to someone is vice to someone else. What is a welcoming of all sorts of ideas is a small-minded wokeness to another person. And so there right. becomes this notion that it's very hard to teach a child goodness because your goodness may be politicized, it may be different to my goodness, and therefore people are concerned that what could look like teaching critical thinking ironically right. becomes perceived as brainwashing to a certain world viewpoint. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but on the other hand, the question is, you know, what's the alternative? So you're not going to teach your, your, your kids about how to navigate the world and how to make decisions. That seems just as dangerous, if not, if not more than the alternative. Also, we can't put some, some flesh on, on the bones of what it means to be virtuous, right? So one thing that you want to do, in fact, is like the Greco-Romans, to stay away from uh, specific content content because the specific content as you say might vary depending on your political opinion or your your view of the world etc cetera, etc cetera. well i firmly believe that it is perfectly possible for somebody on the right side of the political spectrum or the left side of the political spectrum to be virtuous now the virtues however were very clearly articulated by the greco romans the fundamental four the four practic the four basic ones were practical wisdom courage justice and temperance Practical wisdom is knowledge of what is really good for you and or not good for you, as opposed to what other people or Facebook is telling you that it's good for you or not good for you. Courage is the ability to do the right thing or what you think is the right thing, despite the fact that you might suffer consequences, negative consequences. Justice means treating other people with fairness and in the way in which you want to be treated uh, with respect as a human being. And then temperance is doing things in, in right measure, neither too much nor too little. Now, it seems to me that there are plenty of ways to put a politically neutral yeah. flash on these, on these four and, and start teaching kids that this is the way you want to behave. And then it's up to them eventually to put whatever kind of political spin or practical spin they want on things. I mean, that's... You, the, that's you probably need courage, ironically. You need one of those virtues <laughs> as an educator or as a, uh, as a school or as a media or as a political framework to allow the freedom for people to do that, which is that's right. the Socratic point that, you know, uh, the dangers, if you give people knowledge and critical thinking, they may use it against you. You need a bit of courage to, to, to be aware of that as a risk. 
That is that is correct. Uh, look, I, I'm not too much of an optimist about, you know, <laughs> oh, some people are going to read a book like this or, or learn about soccer and all of a sudden things are going to be fine in society. Uh, my goal is is simply to remind people that we can do better. And, and then whoever listens might say, oh, OK, that's actually not a bad idea. Let me see what I can do in my own in my own area with my own kids. Well, well can I leave it on a practical note then? If we leave kids to one side, because that's a kind of education argument. I know you said yeah. that adults are a little set in their ways, and but there is still a potential here for adults listening to this program now. Is it your advice, actually, that you pick a couple of things, a couple of virtues that you've just talked about? And actually, we do try and practice them. We treat them like a musical instrument or going to the gym where we say we're not going to be brilliant right. at it immediately. But actually, if we do select a couple of things, it will become a sort of internal muscle memory, if that's not the wrong metaphor, where we get used to being like that. And actually, in six months time, a year's time, we will be better people in a in a noticeable way. Is that is that is that sort of practical advice? Would Socrates agree with that? Would you agree with that? Is that something people can can do now? Yeah, I, I think they, they can. And in fact, the, the last two chapters of the book are very, very much about that sort of practical advice. The point is, just like you go, look, I, in fact, I just came back from, from the gym and I had my, a session with my trainer. And the goal should be similar. That is, it's not like you say, oh, I want to be a good person. And that means I want to be a Nobel Prize you know, for peace or something like that. That's see, if that's your goal, you're gonna fail. <laughs> just, just, there's almost no, no, no question about it. Just like if you're if you go to the gym and say, oh yeah, I want to participate to the Olympics in a couple of years down the road, that's just not gonna work. But if your goal is, look, I realize that I could be better and I want to be better. Improvement is little by little, and whatever whatever Im improvement you will make, it's gonna make not just your life better, but it's gonna make other people's lives better. Your kids, your 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 relatives, your your friends, even your your coworkers, even people that are actually not not in part of your in their in will it though make it better? Because that's I suppose this is where the courage comes in. Because the world's not necessarily very fair. So you might you might practice a bit, and you might become more virtuous, and you might get taken <laughs> advantage of. You might get, you might be punished. You know, no no virtue goes un, unpunished uh, in, in, in in the real world. Yes, but that really goes down to. Yes, but what do you mean by being better and feeling better? I would argue Socrates' bet uh, is that conscience is important. And people, people ultimately have to reckon with their own conscience. And so that if they know that they've done the right thing and others don't agree or berate them or whatever it is, they're okay. They're at peace with it. It's better to have a good, clean conscience and get some criticism from the outside that get a lot of praise knowing that you've done something bad. That's the bet, of course. And, and I think that, you know, Socrates advanced that bet as a, as a philosopher my background is in evolutionary biology, and I bet that that, that that idea is, in fact, largely correct. We have uh, pro-social instincts, cooperative instincts, because we're social primates. Our, our survival in the past depended on being more or less pro-social. So we do have a conscience, and, and it does have an effect. Well, let's leave it on that optimistic note. We've, we, we've traveled between <laughs> optimism and pessimism throughout this conversation, Massimo. Let's, let's, probably, let's finish on an optimistic note. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, plenty to think about. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today.